Hello there and welcome to MMA Fight Club. I'm your host, Manuel Galarza, and today we're talking about KSW 66, Zolkowski vs. Mankowski, coming up on the 15th of January with a 12 p.m. Eastern start time. You may recognize that date. The 15th is also the same date for UFC Vegas 46. So for all the MMA junkies out there who've been waiting the last few weeks for mixed martial arts to return, it's coming back hot and heavy. You're going to have a full day of events there on the 15th of January. We've got seven fights in total. There's two title bouts between the co-main event and the main event. Now, the fighters may not be recognizable to the casual fan for mixed martial arts, but as you look at the topology and we discuss the background of the fighters, you will notice that they have fought some current UFC guys. And maybe in the case of a few fighters in this card, they may be one or two steps away from the UFC. So I felt like, you know what, it's worth the breakdown. Break down. These are guys that may end up on the scene here in Bellator, PFL, or the UFC in the next year or so. So with that said, we'll go into each fight one fight at a time, give you our favorite picks to win. We're not going to discuss prop bets too much. I don't even know what books will offer this event. I'm crossing my fingers. DraftKings or FanDuel will be offering it, but not sure offhand. As a reminder, we offer a free video library in every one of our breakdowns. What I mean by that is if you go to the description here on YouTube, you will find links to the prior fights of the fighters we're talking about. I think it's imperative when you're betting on any of these fights, don't just take our advice here or any capper's advice for that matter. Go to the video library, take advantage of it. It's absolutely free. You could watch two to three prior fights of the fighters we're talking about. You could watch those fights while you listen to our breakdown, see if you compare notes and it comes together similar to what we have. Anyway, with that said, take advantage of the library. Thank you for joining us. If you haven't done so already, you know what to do. Like and subscribe. Here we go, guys. All right, the first fight in the prelim card is going to open up with a welterweight bat at 170 pounds between two Polish fighters. You got Kasper Kuzerzewski versus Hubert Sismaja. I don't know how to say these nasty names. I apologize. I'm going to call this guy Hubert, and I'm going to call this guy Kasper. Keep my life damn simple. So Hubert's 9-4 and four overall. He's 32 years old, Polish fighter, 5'10 in height, so about 2 inches shorter than his opponent here, with a 70-and-a-half-inch reach, so about a 1-inch disadvantage here on the reach. He trains out of a gym called Dziki. Washad Biala Podleska. Oh my gosh, you can laugh at me. It's okay. I'm trying. I'm trying. Now, as for Casper, seven and four overall, three and two in his last five fights. Twenty six years old in eight months. He'll be twenty seven soon. He's six foot in height, a little bit of a height advantage, and a seventy one point seven reach, about a one inch reach advantage there over Hubert. He's out of real grappling work law. Now, according to Petapology, it looks like Casper is getting most of the votes here, seventy percent to be exact. I like Casper to win the fight. There's value here at that money line of minus 165. He is the local Polish prospect. He is the guy who's younger. I understand Hubert is Polish too, but at 9-4 and four, and 32 years old in seven months, about to be 33, I'm taking the much younger guy here who's got a, a good record, similar in terms of their four losses each, but as a guy that I think has more room to grow here, he's making bigger improvements, he's a younger fighter, whereas Hubert, I think we're getting what we're going to get from him. Okay, we're seeing what we're going to see from this guy. Now, he's also going to be a little shorter and have a reach disadvantage. I'm not sure it's a gigantic deal here, but Casper, he's going to have some reach advantage at 170 pounds. We could see some violence. Okay, these guys are lower level. It is the first fight in the card. I wouldn't throw too much money at this. If anything, maybe parlay it with some other stuff just to have some fun and see if it ends up hitting. But at minus 165, the value is there with Casper. I think once he gets to like minus 200, if that ends up happening, probably too chalky, not a two to one favorite, but definitely a one and a half, you know, a favorite. I think uh, at least the guy who I think is going to win this fight more times than not against a guy who's a little bit older another prospect now could i be wrong and this thing goes upside down absolutely i'm not going to wager in this fight either way i suggest you don't either i suggest we watch these first two playing fights take some notes get to know these guys a little bit maybe on the line we get to see them again we get a chance to wager them with some more confidence but i'm not going to touch this thing with a 10-foot pull i'm choosing cash to win the fight though good luck the guys. second fight for the premium card is going to be a bantamweight bout at 135 pounds between patrick Serdan from poland and david martinick from czech republic martinick is five and three overall He's 24 years old, 5'10 in height with 71 inch reaches out of Octagon Team Chisholm. As for Patrick Serdan, who's 5'2 overall, the Polish fighter is 5'7 in height, so 3 inches shorter than David, and got a 67 inch reach, so about 3 inches shorter here, 3 to 4 inches shorter reach than David. And his uh, gym of choice, where he trains out of his Black Horse MMA Lamza. Now, looking at the Tapology public votes here, it looks as if Serdan is getting 69% of the votes here, 31% of the votes are coming from Arnik. I'm not going to go into a deep dive with this, it's prelims, it's. Um, you know, lower level, I think, fighters. But I think Patrick Serdan is significantly better than David. This is the perfect setup for him. A good way for him to get some confidence, get some experience. He is the Polish fighter. He is the local guy. Home cooking. I'm telling you right now, you don't want to bet against any Polish fighters in KSW when you got a guy coming from the Czech Republic who, at 5-3, and three, he's like one loss away from basically being almost a 500-level fighter. I'm going to take Patrick Serdan, the local guy from Poland. He's from Lamza, Poland. He's going to have a fan base there, the crowd there. If the fight somehow gets close, and it's a bantamweight, 135 pounds, 
Probably nobody gets knocked out here, right? If it's close because of the scorecards, I like Patrick Sernan to win the fight. Now, according to the money line here, there's some value there because Sernan's at minus 133. You got David at plus 100. These first three fights in the card, the first two prelim bouts and then the first fight, uh, Mikel Matarla versus Jason Radcliffe, those are all less, more or less pick em fights. You know, and if you could find a good lean, take it. I'm going to pass on all these early fights, the prelim fight, the two prelim fights and the Mikel fight. I just feel like there's too many variables. It's very low level. Anything's possible. But with that said, if you're going to bet on this Patrick Sardin fight, I think you take Sardin here. I think at 26 years old, he's the prospect. He's the guy. Um, it's, again, home cooking. I'm taking Patrick Sardin by a decision to win this fight. Good luck with this All one. right. The first fight in the main card should be a middleweight bat at 185 pounds between the Polish fighter Mikhail Matarla versus Jason Radcliffe from the United Kingdom. Radcliffe goes by the Assassin. He's 17-8 overall. He hails specifically from London, England, six foot one in height with a 77 inch reach. We do not have an age number here on Jason Radcliffe. He fights out of Firkit top team. Um, almost like fuck it. But anyway, I apologize. Michael Materla, who goes by uh, Sepio, is 30 and eight overall, three and two in his last five fights. All tatted up. This Polish fighter is about to be 38 years old. So getting up there in age, he's six foot in height with a 75 inch reach. He trains it also out of Berksaker's team. Now, according to Tapology, Materla is getting 55% of the public votes here. 45% of, the votes, 45 of the votes are coming in for Radcliffe, and I don't have a lot to go on here, guys. I did notice um, that Jason Radcliffe, you know, has a pretty decent career. He's fought some okay opponents, um, nothing that's very high level, but he has fought guys uh, that are Bellator level experience, and he has fought he's fought in Bellator, and he's won and lost in Bellator. So he's got that going for him. For Mikel, um, you know, he's never fought in Bellator, never fought UFC, never fought really much outside the KSW promotion and he has fought a lot of ksw fights like almost 20 ksw fights with a very good record he's lost a few fights in, in you know within that that run but he's got a lot of wins and he's done a pretty good job he's pretty much a ksw veteran a staple of that division so i think what happens here i think the home cooking is going to be on the side of mikhail materla i think he can probably squeeze this out and that's why he is a favorite here slightly at minus 135 but you got Jason Radcliffe here with some variables. Here's a guy who's coming into this fight off of a win last year, 2021. He fought twice last year. I'm sorry. He won one, lost one. But he's coming in here with some skill. Very strong guy. He's got some finishing ability. He finished his last last win. Um, so I think he's going to test Mikel Martella. But I think the home cooking, Mikel Martella, the Polish fighter, local guy, if this gets to a decision, which both fighters do go to decision pretty often, I think he gets the edge there just because he's from, you know, from Poland. Whereas for Jason Radcliffe, the path to victory is going to have to be a finish, buddy. It can't be a close fight. You can't trade with this guy back and forth. Both of them are getting older. I don't know how old Jason Radcliffe is exactly, but based upon that profile picture, it looks like he's in his mid-30s somewhere. So with that said, guys, I'm passing all together in this fight. Not going to be wagering. Too many variables, too many unknowns, very low level. It's the first fight in the main card. We've got a lot of action later on. We're going to talk more in detail where we feel more confident about. For this fight right here, I'm picking Mikel Materla, Materla to win the fight, but not with a lot of confidence, and I'm going to pass. When you look at this number here, what is it? Minus 135, at least to pick them. So if you pick one side or the other, it's a it's a coin flip. You know, Do the best you can on it if you're going to wager, but I would stay away from this guy. So this guy is the ultimate epitome or definition of gambling. Like You're just gambling here. You're flipping your coin, and you're gambling. I don't like doing it that way myself. So Good luck if you're waging the fight. If you're not waging, just watching. Just just watch. Take some notes. Enjoy it. Get warmed up for the for the main card uh, and the main event there. So take care. Good luck with this one, guys. All right. Next fight in the card is going to be a light heavyweight bout, 205 pounds between two Polish fighters, Wojciech Chanuz versus Przemyslav Dzwonarek. I know I'm killing those names. I'm going to call Przemyslav. I'm going to call him Prez. And I'm going to call Wojciech Chanuz Woj, just to make my life easier the rest of this breakdown. So Woj who's 10 and seven overall, two and three in his last fights. Notably, notably, he fought twice 2021, lost both fights, hasn't won a fight in about two years. He's 31 years old, six foot in height with no reach number. He's training out of Berksirker's team, which is a team that we've seen a few times in the card. Must be a pretty good gym. Now, as for Prez, three and one overall, okay? He's also from Poland, six foot two in height, so two inches in a height advantage with a 72.8 inch reach. He trains out of Orzelv Nymilislav. Oh my God, I'm killing myself with these pronunciations. Anyway, the public votes here are coming in on the side of Janus. 54% are coming in for Woj Janus and only 46% uh, coming in the other side here for Prez. The first concern I have when looking at Prez Tapology, okay, he's 3-1 and one as a pro and 2-0 and as an amateur. So you're like, all right, good, good winning percentage. But who is he beating? His last fight against a guy named Bartos, which is last year in May, that guy's 0-1 in his career. The prior win, Jacob uh, Slomka, that guy's 1-1. One one. So he has not fought anybody, okay? He fought 1-2021, 1-2020, once 2019 and once 2018. So, you know, it's just a little bit odd. Now, when you look at his amateur record, it does pop out to you that he's got a 2021 win by decision as an amateur fighter. 
how is that possible? I don't know. I don't know how you can go pro in 2018 and then start fighting amateur fights again in 2021. Needless to say, the level of competition is a gigantic concern here for a guy that looks like he has a decent record. He's okay looking physically, you know, here, but I would imagine if he fights anybody with any level of good skill, he's going to have a hard time. It's going to be a big step up in competition, right? Now, as for Woj, he's coming off of back-to-back -back losses in 2021. He lost by a uh, choke in round one to Edgar De Souza, and he lost to Marcin Lazares by a decision. That was 2021. His last one was back in 2020, August 2020, I'm sorry, um, October 2020 via Darce Choke over Michelle Gutowski. So looking at his, again, tapology, you don't notice anything that's very impressive here. What you do see is inconsistency, up and down, up and down. He went 3-0 as an amateur, started his career off 4-0 as a pro, and then went on a four-fight losing streak. So 4-0 to start his career, then he goes 4-4, four four, then he wins four more in a row, and then he drops another one. So he tends to get you know on a streak, he'll win a few fights in a row, and then he'll lose a few fights in a row. He's in the middle of a bad streak right now, having lost two fights in a row here to very low-level competition. So this fight, look, you could, you could go ahead and gamble on it because you just want to have action. But at minus 300, Woj is pretty chalky. And I don't know that he's the much better fighter here. I assume he's the better fighter. I don't have a lot to go on. So, you know, I didn't get a chance, like I said, to uncover a lot of details in these two guys. The film is spotty at best. I would stay far away from this fight. That's why I didn't do a deep breakdown because when you start looking at it, there's just too many variables. You're basically risking whatever you're gambling. Now, if you want to just play with a dog here, a dog or pass, that's not an awful idea. At plus 240, it's, it's, it's there for you, right? The problem is, again, if he goes out there and just gets slept in 30 seconds, you're like, all right, well, I, I shouldn't have put my money out there on this guy because I variables, again, opponents, the whole deal. So bet with caution in this fight. Good luck, guys. For all the hardcore Polish MMA fans, they're probably like, no, nah, man, I'm going to bet this guy. I'm going to bet that guy. I know for sure. I don't know for sure or too many variables for me, so I'm going to be a little cautious here and not place any wagers on this particular bout. Good luck. Next fight in the card, moving on up, is going to be a lightweight bout at 155 pounds between Sebastian Rajewski from Poland and Nicholas Backstrom from Sweden. Backstrom goes by King in the North. He's 11-3 overall, 3-2 in his last five fights, 32 years old, 6 foot one and high with a 73-inch reach. He trains out of All-Stars Training Center. As for Rajewski, he's 11-6 overall, 4-1 in his last five fights, 29 years old, 5 to 10 in height, so about 2 inches shorter here than his opponent, and he's 68 and a half inch reach, so he's going to have about 5 inch reach disadvantage here against Nicholas Backstrom. He trains out of Sizwani Smock, which is a pretty good gym. I've seen that gym noted on a few of the fighters on this card. Now, looking down at Tapology, it appears that Rajewski is getting 64% of the votes here, only 36% of the votes coming in for Backstrom. I get it. Uh, I think Rajewski is a pretty, pretty good fighter. The biggest elephant in the room here is that Nicholas Backstrom has not fought in four and a half years. Yeah, four and a half years. And then the fight between that fight and the fight prior to that, it was a year layoff. So just don't love the inactivity at all here in the case of Nicholas Backstrom. Now, Nicholas Backstrom, when you do watch him on film, long striker, Muay Thai stance, phenomenal kicking game. There's one link there to watch a prior fight of his where he kicks a guy straight, like 15 seconds first round, straight kick right in the face, knocks him down, finishes the fight 15 seconds. It looked good. Problem is, it's just so long. That was 2014, you know? So I couldn't find much film on um, Backstrom that's recent. And again, a four and a half year layoff. Now, as for looking at Rajewski, you know, I'm not sure what his weakness is other than the fact that maybe he's not fighting the best competition, but he is more active. He's got good footwork. He too is a very good kickboxer and he uses a kickboxing type of stance. I imagine this is going to be a very exciting fight for the fans in terms of someone's going to get kicked at some point, head, body, or something. And that's probably going to lead to the end of the fight at some point. So, with that said here, my notes in the fighters, which are not very many notes, but I have a little bit of notes here. Sebastian Rajewski, he's a southpaw. I did notice that, but he will switch stances. He'll even do something where he'll switch stances and then throw like a spinning kick. It's got good footwork, this guy. Very good on his feet. No notable opponents for Rajewski. I didn't notice anybody from like PFL, Bellator, nothing like that on his resume. The positives I see on Sebastian, two fight winning streak, seven and one in his last eight fights with three finishes. A solid wrestler, and he knows how to work well when he's in top position on the ground. His kicking game is very impressive. Spinning kicks, oblique kicks, leg and body kicks. You're going to see a lot of kicking action here coming from Sebastian Rajewski. My concerns with him, a moderate finish rate. He's got three finishes in his last nine fights. Okay, so the finish rate is definitely going down, and the opponent level has been, ah, you know, so it's not like he's fighting UFC guys and his finish rate's going down. He's fighting guys in, you know, regional promotions type of thing and uh, not really finishing most of these guys. So looking at Nicholas Backstrom, Thai boxing background, Nasty front kick. If you watch that film, you'll see him end a fight with a front kick. His most notable opponent, he did fight Andrew Fisher in 2017. He lost to him via decision. Now, Fisher is a former Bellator fighter, pretty decent fighter. Um, my concerns with uh, 
Nicholas Backstrom, they're obvious. I mentioned it. Four and a half year layoff. The one year layoff between the last two fights he fought. He started his career 8-0. Like, came out gangbusters looking good. If you watch the guy fight, he's got like an edge to him. Attitude, you know. He's got some spunk to him. Starts his career off 8-0. Now in his last six fights, he's 3-3. Three and three. He's slowed down quite a bit. The fights we watched to break down this film was Nicholas Backstrom versus Koga, 2014, where he knocked that guy out in the first round. Sebastian Wojewski versus Sawanski, 2021, where he got that win by decision. A good fight. Very good fight uh, to watch there, these two fighters. Now, I don't know what else to go off here than the fact that, look, at minus 250, Rajewski is the rightful favorite. He's a few years younger, a lot more active. When you look at Nicholas Backstrom, it's, it's, it's hard not to fall in love with the kicking and how good he looks, but I don't care what you say. Four and a half years is four and a half years. That kind of a layoff is super scary. The best way to look at this fight from a betting perspective is probably just pass all around because Sebastian Rajewski should be the guy who would win. He is the more you know um, uh, active fighter, but we've seen this before where a guy can come two, three-year layoff. We don't know what he's doing. And next thing you know, he shows up there and he looks like better, bigger, stronger, faster, the whole nine. Now, for Nicholas Backstrom, yeah, it's been four and a half years. Last time he fought was about 28 years old. He's 32. He's still very young. So from one side of it, you could say, we just have no idea. Could Nicholas Backstrom come in here, look really good, take the win, upset Sebastian Rajewski? Absolutely. And then at that point, you're like, oh, the plus money, I should have been there. This is maybe a dogger pass. But at the same time, again, we just don't know enough. So for me, it's just a pass all the way around. Sebastian should win the fight here, but I'm not going to be surprised if Nicholas Backstrom comes in here, like having trained in like Siberia somewhere for the last few years and comes in here a whole new guy and changes things up and actually gets the win. So that's my breakdown, guys. I'm sorry I don't have some more con concrete information on these two guys or a side I could lean towards. But again, with this long layoff, too many variables in the air. Good luck with this fight, guys. I'll be betting on it. All right, next up on the card is going to be a lightweight bat at 155 pounds between Lucas Rajewski from Poland and Donovan Desme from Belgium. Desme goes by Vegas. He's 14-7 and seven overall, 2-3 and three in his last five fights, 30 years old, 5'11 in height with a 71.3 inch reach. He trains out of Red Kings. As for Lucas Rajewski, the Polish fighter, he goes by Raju, or maybe it's Rayu. I'm going to say Rayu. That's sounds cooler. Rayu is 11-6 and six overall, 3-2 in his last five fights, 32 years old, so about two years older. He's 5'10 in height with a 71.7 inch reach, about the same reach, and one is shorter here than his opponent, Donovan Desme. As for Lucas Rajewski, he trains out of Ankos MMA Pazin. Now, according to the public votes here on Tapology, you got about 200 votes here so far submitted. 80% of the votes are coming in here for Rayu. I agree. I think Ryu's going to win the fight here, and I'll explain it. It's not going to be a very you know, long breakdown here. It's pretty simple. Uh, Ryu's been a pro for about 13 years, almost 14 years. Donovan's been a pro for about nine years. Fighting style, Lucas is a kickboxer, a phenomenal front kick. He uses it early and often. He uses it not only to hit his opponent, but to measure distance and sort of keep the distance he wants. So nice front kick. He'll be using it early, and he'll use it throughout the fight. So he's got a kickboxing style. As for Donovan Desme, more of a stand-up boxer, okay? His footwork is pretty good. He's built very stocky. He looks more like a wrestler, but he's a stand-up guy. He wants to stand up on the feet, fight in the feet, circle the cage, and he's got decent foot. Again, really good footwork for his physique. Now, the weakness here for Donovan Desme, cardio, man. Oh, that's the worst, right? When you have an athlete who's got a cardio issue, he starts off the fight good. I mean, he, really well. We'll talk about some of the specific fights where he starts off, he's winning the fight, and then by the end of round one, he's like, oh, I'm tired. My arms are down. So it's been obvious in his recent fights that he's got something going on with the cardio. As for Lucas Rajewski, his weakness is activity. Um, he fought one time in 2021, I believe, right? And then one time in 2020, a um, few times, twice in 2019. But, you know, just has not fought a lot recently. You'd like to see more activity from a guy who's approaching his prime years at 32 years old, right? So looking here at the notes of the two fighters, let's talk here about Lucas Rajewski first. So Rajewski, Ryu, he likes to use front kicks, as we talked about. He'll set the tone, measure distance. If the front kick lands in the body area, it's effective. He can hit a guy right in the stomach area, the chest, back the guy up. And in the case of Don and Desme, who likes to duck his head, he might even kick him in the head. Um, his most notable opponent for Lucas is Mads Burnell. Yeah, they fought back in 2018. He lost round one via rear naked choke. Now, Burnell has UFC experience, and he's currently on a seven-fight winning streak between Bellator and Cage Warriors. So that's by far the most notable competition for Rajewski. Now, the positives like on Lucas. He's on a three-fight winning streak, two decisions, one rear naked choke. <clears throat> Solid front kick to the body. He's light on his feet. He will lead the dance. He will pressure the pace. Even if he's a taller fighter and the guy, you know, he's going against is a good wrestler, he still will pressure the pace and back that guy up. Donovan will fall right into that because Donovan likes to back up, likes to circle. That's his. That's sort of his style. So it might work perfectly for, for Lucas that he can lead the fight, lead the dance, does what he wants to do. Now, he's a solid grappler. Lucas Rajewski is a very good grappler. He pulled a unique heel hook in 2018 over Zulik. That link's in the description. You can watch that fight. It was a very unique heel hook. I'm not usually a big fan of heel hooks. Um, 
but it was really unique the way he did it. And the guy was trying to defend it. He just couldn't. So Lucas rajewski has got a little bit of grappling ability there. Now, my biggest concern again on him is activity, limited competition, hasn't been in the cage a lot. So you know, a lot of unknowns there from Lucas Rajewski. Now, as for Donovan Desmay, there's probably even more variables on him. He's got an 0-1 amateur record, went pro 2012, so been a pro for about 10 years. He was supposed to fight Patty Pimblett. If you look at his topology, he was scheduled to fight Patty Pimblett in 2019 and 2020. The reason why, not sure what happened. It looks like 2020, he backed out of the fight. That's uh, Donovan Desmay, not sure why. 2019, not sure what happened there either. But anyway, um, the positives I'll look here on Donovan Desmond. He is an active fighter. He fought twice in 2021, obviously 2022. Start the new year off, he's fighting right away again. He's got a solid chin, okay? In his fight when he fought against, um, his last fight against Roman Zamanski, he took some hard-ass hits in that fight and was able to take them with ease. Well, not, I shouldn't say with ease, but he took them well. He sure he's got a solid chin. He's a pretty durable fighter, right? Now, looking here at the additional side-by-side -side comparisons I have with the two fighters here, in terms of experience, about the same, 11 and 6 versus 14 and 7, almost the same amount of fights. IQ-wise, I give a slight edge to Lucas Rajewski because he doesn't have the cardio issue, right? I don't like when guys have cardio issues. That, that to me is also a little bit of um, a little bit of IQ, like your ability to focus, have the right training camp, do the, do the road work, you know, know that your cardio's in, intact. Now, for cardio, again, I give an edge there for, for Lucas over Donovan. Finishing-wise, you know, I think Lucas is a better grappler. He can get a heel hook, could do something of that nature. Whereas Donovan Desmond, if he doesn't knock the guy out initially early on and, like, hurt somebody early first round, his finishing ability just goes out the damn window, right? Boxing-wise, I like Lucas Rodrusky's his, his technique more. A little tighter, a little straighter punches. Uses a kicking game, whereas Donovan Desmay just hardly ever kicks at all. So grappling-wise, I, I think it's neutral when they're fresh. So when they're fresh, Donovan Desmay is a strong dude, compact, little shorter, strong guy overall, good wrestler, solid wrestler, right? But again, once we get to round two, round three, do not be surprised if Lucas Rajewski, Ryu, is now on top of Donovan Desmay, delivering ground and pound, and Donovan cannot get up. So that's the breakdown for this fight, guys. Not sure what it's going to end up being when the windows closes, but right now it's at minus 200 here for Lucas Rajewski and plus 150 for Donovan Desmay. I think that's about right. I think Lucas here is a significantly better fighter. I think Donovan Desme is decent. He's a good opponent. He's going to come out there and give a good accountability of himself and actually, you know, give a good fight. But Lucas Rajewski, Rayu, should definitely win this fight. I like him at minus 200. Do I like it enough to play a full unit of minus, two, uh, minus 200? I'm not sure. Maybe. But if anything, maybe I'll parlay this piece depending on how Wilbrook's offer it. So good luck with this fight, guys. Next fight in the card is going to be a welterweight bout at 170 pounds between two very good Polish fighters, Tomasz Romanowski, who goes by Tommy, and Christian Kazubowski, who goes by Chris. Pretty simple nicknames for these two guys, right? So Chris is 9-2 overall, 3-2 in his last five fights. He's 27 years old, 5-11 in height. Notably, their reach numbers are identical. So 68.9 inches uh, for Christian and 68.9 for Tomasz. We'll round that out to a cool 69-inch reach. As for the gym that Christian's out of, he trains out of Mighty Bulls Gidnia. As for Tomasz Romanowski, he's 14-8 overall, so a few more fights are in his belt. 4-1 in his last five fights. Been on a pretty hot streak. We'll talk about that. 32 years old in 10 months. We'll round that up to 33 years old, so about six years older than Christian. He's 5'10", one inch shorter, and again, the reach is the same. He trains out of Berkshire's team, Star God, and Berkshire's team. Not sure if there's a difference there, but anyway, looking at topology, the public votes here are coming in for Romanowski. At 63% votes coming in for Romanowski, only 38% coming in for Christian. Fairly close there according to topology. I like Christian Kozabowski to win the fight. We're going to talk about this briefly. It's not going to be a long breakdown, but I'll give you my reasons why. Looking at them side by side, the fighting style, Tom Tomas is more of a brawler boxer, forward pace, pushes the pressure. That's one of his, his best attributes is he forward, his forward pressure is constant. That could be a problem for him at times, but most of the time it helps to win his fights. Forward pressure, you know, crowd on the guy in front of him, force him against the cage, owning the middle of the, uh, owning the, middle of the octagon and forcing his opponent to circle. Now, as for Christian Kozabowski, he's a grappler boxer, so he does got some boxing ability, but he's a little better in grappling than Tomas, and one of his strong suits for Christian is his wrestling. I've heard commentators say that Tomas is a good wrestler. I just haven't seen it. And we're going to talk specifically how he lost fights because of his wrestling, whereas Christian Kozabowski has won fights due to his wrestling. So the weakest thing for Christian is experience. Only 9-2 and two has not fought high-level opponents. This will probably be his biggest test. For Tomas, his weakness is wrestling. We're going to talk about it. I want to highlight it. So looking at the notes here on the fighters side by side, Tomas Romanowski, 12-year pro experience, started his pro career 0-3. Interesting, right? And then from there, obviously, improved his record. He's 2-1 KSW. He is a southpaw, notably, and he did have a nice knockout, one of his recent fights where he threw a left hook on this guy and just folded him over. He is on a hot streak. Tomas right now is 9-1-1. 
Nine one and one in his last eleven fights. So one no contest, one loss, and nine wins. A very active fighter. Fought twice in two thousand twenty one. He's starting the season off or starting the year off here with another fight early in two thousand twenty two. And he fought four times in two thousand twenty. So six times over the last two years. The guy's very active. He's coming off of a first round KO with a nasty left hand counter shot. He walks down his opponents as we mentioned, and great forward pressure. The concerns I have for Tomas, the wrestling. As I mentioned, okay, forward pressure set him up at times to get walk into either takedowns or get off balance. So he does have forward pressure, but he can get off balance at times. Okay, so he got taken down and dominated on, on the ground by Kinkle in 2020. Once he got taken down by Kinkle in round two, he never got up. He never got up. He got grounded and pounded. And the commentators were all like, oh, I can't believe this is happening. I expected Tomas to do this. It just gave me a glimpse into Tomas's wrestling. It's not as good as people think. And then you flip the flip film over to Christian. He's actually a pretty damn good wrestler. So let's talk here about Christian Kozabowski. Don't have a lot of personal information on these two guys. I, I, I did the best I could to search high and wide. I'm not familiar with these guys prior to do this breakdown, so I apologize. I don't have any details as we do against like UFC opponents or Bellator opponents, but we do the best we can here, right? The positives I have here in Christian Kozabowski, he's displayed good wrestling ability. For example, against Jacob in 2020, he uses the takedowns to set up a win. I mean, he's aggressive. He's big. He will be slightly taller, but he's got a very good, you know, well-balanced physique, and he knows how to wrestle. Now, he has displayed KO power as well. He's got three finishes in the last five fights, so he can finish a little bit, even though his last two wins were by decision. My concern for Christian is he is coming off of a split decision loss. I mean, it's a split decision, but nonetheless, it's a loss. The fights we watched in these two fighters to break down this film, we watched Tomas Romanowski versus Rakas in 2021, Romanowski versus Keinkel in 2021, Kazabowski versus um, Kaminaris in 2020, and Kazabowski versus Mitchell Michalski in 2018. So those are the four fights we watched to break down this film. Those four fights, as usual, those links are in the description so you can watch them on your own. This should be a tough fight. I do think the age might be a factor too. 27 years old versus 33. Tomas Romanowski is a good fighter. I'm not taking anything from him. But he can slow down at times. Whereas Christian Kazabowski, the younger fighter, at 27 years old, six years a junior, I think he's got a little more in the tank. I think if the fight gets to round three, that he's going to be a little fresher. This is a three-round fight, not a championship bout, not a main card bout by any means. But still, I like Christian Kazabowski. Now, at plus 105, I like him even more, right? This is a pick though. Minus 145 to Romanowski, plus 105 for Christian. I'm going to go with Christian Kazabowski and, uh, with, a, with a little bit of confidence. Not a lot of confidence, but I would not have a lot of confidence, confidence going with Tomas Romanowski, who has showed us recently that wrestling is a crutch for him. I'm pretty sure Christian knows that. He's watched film on him. His coaches know that. He should come in here with a game plan to at least take the fight to the ground at some point. On the feet, no question, Tomas Romanowski has not got power. He can hurt Christian and vice versa. So I think, again, for Christian to take the smartest path to victory, grapple him up, take him to the ground. He won't have to look too far. Tomas will be right in his face. Tomas will be going forward the entire time. Tomas, to a fault, will have forward pressure. And I, I think at some point, if he fights an elite level striker or an elite level counter striker, he could walk into something nasty, a nasty knee, a nasty uppercut, a counter, because he walks forward with reckless abandon. He doesn't care. He's a tough guy. He's going to take a few punches to give a few punches, but it gets a younger guy like Christian Kozabowski. Can he move his feet? Can he, can he slip and move away from a punch and counter him and catch, you know, Romanowski off balance? Maybe. Anyway, I like the younger fighter here, Christian Kozabowski, to win the fight. Good luck, guys. The co-main event for KSW says he's going to be a light heavyweight bout 205 pounds between the title holder Tomasz Khan from Poland and Ibrahim Czeskaya from Russia. Czeskaya is 15-5 and five overall. He's hailing from Grozny, Russia, which actually that word Grozny in Russian means like angry, powerful, intimidating person. So good name for his hometown, right? Grozny, Russia. 30 years old. He's six foot height with no reach number on him. But based upon watching film on Ibrahim, I think his reach is going to be about 70 to 71 inches, about 5 to 7 inches shorter here than his opponent. He trades at a Berkut FC, which is a very good gym. Now, as for Tomasz Narkan, the Polish fighter, he goes by Zarayev. I don't know what that means, but it sounds pretty cool. He's 18 and 4 overall, 3 2 in his last five fights. He's 32 years old, two years older than his opponent. Six foot three, so three inches taller than Ibrahim, and a 77 inch reach. Again, he should have a reach advantage here over Ibrahim. He trains out of Berkshire's or Berkshire's team. Now, according to Tapology, it looks like Narkan is the favorite, getting about 80% of the votes here coming in for Narkan, about 18 to 20% of the votes here coming for Chizgayev. Look, I get it. When you start looking more into this fight, you realize that Ibrahim, this will be his second fight here at this weight class. So it's kind of new to him. He fought one time before this in a different in this weight class. It was a can, like a 500 level fighter. This will be a big test for him and also a big step up in, you know, just overall talent, weight class, the whole nine, right? Now, side by side, Tamaz, he's a kickboxer fighting style. Ibrahim is more of a brawler, 
He's a boxer, grappler, but just more of a brawler. No like specific technique for boxing or kickboxing. His wrestling is okay. His strength would be in the wrestling. For Ibrahim, if he could wrestle this fight to the ground, get some top control, get some position control over Tomas, that would be his path to victory. Now, the weakness for Ibrahim, his size, man. He's going to be undersized here, not just physically, but like every which way, shape, or form. On the mat, on the feet, it's going to be tough for him. For Tomas, his strength is kicking. For a heavy guy like this in light heavyweight division, he throws a lot of kicks, man. Front kicks, kicks to the legs. He'll just measure his opponent with just like light kicks. Not not hard kicks, but just light kicks to the body, lower leg, little check kick here and there. So a lot of kicking action here from Tamaz. It's one of his strengths. The issue I have with Tamaz, it shows up in some of his prior fights, is the cardio. He does get tired at times, and he is the bigger guy. So for Ibrahim, his path to victory would be circling the opponent, keeping the fight on the feet, you know, being able to work at a distance, um, which somehow being able to avoid those kicks as well. So I don't know how he gets this win here. I think at minus 333, Tomas, it's probably making sense. The money line is a little chalky, but it makes sense. You have a natural light heavyweight here. If I need to get to a guy who's been a middleweight most of his career, stepping up for this fight. Now, looking at my notes here on the two fighters, we'll talk about Narcon first. Narcon. All right, so Thomas Narcon, he's the current champion. He's 1-0. He had a 1-0 amateur record. He went pro in 2019, so 14-year pro career. He's 10-3 in KSW. He's 4-1 in M and M1, which is a Russian promotion. He lost twice in the last uh, four fights against Phil DeFries. Now, not great losses. You don't want to lose against the same guy twice in the last four fights. But Phil DeFries is a former UFC fighter. We'll talk more about that. He lost 2021 to him via TKO in round two, and he lost 2019 via decision. Now, notable opponents. Phil DeFries, as we just mentioned, he lost to him twice over the last few years. Now, Fries went two and three in the UFC. Um, so, again, a guy who had UFC experience, so not the worst loss. Now, he did. Now, consider this. Now, DeFries, he lost three UFC fights all by early KOs. Round one, 19 seconds to Matt Matrone. Round one, 43 seconds to Stipe Miocic. And then round one, two minutes and four seconds to Todd Duffy. So, keep it in mind that Phil DeFries, who beat Tomas twice... He got served up in the UFC, three straight KO losses, and eventually was out of there. Now, the biggest win for the career here for Tomas Rakan is over Ivan Erzlan. He beat him in 2000 and, uh, what, two years ago by rear naked choke, round two. Erzlan was 9-0 prior to that fight. Now, Erzlan is 11-1 at this point, so his only loss for Ivan Erzlan was again against Tomas. Good win for him. He also beat Mamed Khal Khalidov, which is a Russian fighter who's 35-8-2. Now, he had at the time pretty good record. Mamed is kind of slowing down, but he beat him in 2018 twice by decision and by triangle choking round one. Those are the two most notable wins there for Tomas Narcan over his career. The positive, like a, unlike a Tomas, he's only been finished twice in his career. Um, he has been in there with some UFC level guys like DeFries, right? He's got a high finish rate. He's actually won by finish in 11 of his last 12 wins. I mean, think about it. 11 of his last 12 wins for Tomas have been by finish. He's a pretty active fighter, and he's very active with his kicks. For a guy who's a bigger guy, light heavyweight, he's active. Like, he's actually moving, throwing kicks. Now, he gets tired at times, but I do like the activity when he's not tired. He's got a decent submission game for a light heavyweight as well. I do like the fact he's got some submissions. He'll look for submissions early on. If he gets guy on the ground, he'll take the back. He'll look for a submission opportunity. Now, my concerns on Tomas. He's been finished five times in his career. Matter of fact... 83% of the time that he gets he gets he loses, it's by finish. He's only been decision lost one time. The rest of the times have been all by finish. His takedown defense is not great. You saw that against against Fries, where he could not stop takedowns late in the fight. He got tired, he didn't move his legs, he got taken out easily. He was very fatigued early in round two against the fight against Fries. Again, an issue for me would be here against Ibrahim. If Ibrahim could stay away from him, circle. Take the fight to the deeper, you know, waters, round four, round five. Maybe he has a cardio advantage over here, but size-wise, Tomas is going to be just a much bigger fight to lean on him, right? Looking at Ibrahim, okay, he's from Russia. He's got several world, European, and national championships. In what sport? I don't know. I tried to find out what sport. Was it kickboxing? Was it wrestling? Was it grappling? Judo? I don't know, but he has he has accolades in world, European, and national championships. I just don't know what in, in what um, you know what discipline. He's got a six-fight winning streak going on right now with back-to-back -back finishes. He's got three finishes in the last six fights, so coming in here with a lot of momentum. Again, though, the problem is, though, he's coming in off of a win against a guy who's like 13 and 15 or 15 and 13, a very middling, low-level light heavyweight. That was his first light heavyweight fight. This will be his second one. A big step up through the belt. You know what I mean? Um, for Ibrahim, I like the quickness. He's going to have a quickness advantage here over Tomas. He's a smaller fighter. He'll be able to circle, good footwork. Um, and so those will be his opportunities to possibly confuse Tamaz, make it to his liking, get the fight to lower, you know, to, to round four, round five, so he gets a chance to actually expose Tomas. Now, my concerns with Ibrahim. It's his second fight as a light heavyweight. I mean, the reality is he's not experienced in this division. He's a smaller guy. It's six feet. He really should be fighting down, in my opinion. I think he's going up right now against a guy who's just too much, too big. It's a high level of competition. The size will be overwhelming. If 
for some way, shape, or form, Ibrahim ends up on his back on the ground and Tomas is on top of him. And Tomas likes to grapple too. Tomas will be so much heavier and so much bigger. It would be impossible for Ibrahim to get up. And if he tries to get up and get his back up, Tomas will rear naked choke him. Now, the films that we watch in these two fighters, we watch Tomas Narcon versus Phil DeFry, 2021. We watch uh, Tomas Narcon versus even, uh, Ivan Erzlan, 2020. Ibrahim Josiah versus uh, Piotr Strauss, 2019. Ibrahim Josiah versus Alex Garcia, 2019. And then we watch a promo. There's a link there in the description for a promo of Josiah versus Narcon for this per- fight coming up. You get a chance to li- listen to them speak. It's all translated to the bottom screen so you actually read it in English as to what they're saying. But both guys seem to be very cerebral. They're focused. They want the fight. But, a man, again, for Ibrahim coming in here to go to Poland, to me it looks like he's the guy coming in here to lose. And they're serving him up to Tomas, a guy who's got the title, who is Polish, be in front of his fans. If the fight, God forbid, gets close, you got to pick the, pick the guy who's going to be a hometown kid. Now, too chalky for me at minus 333 to bet it straight up. Probably will look to parlay it depending upon what books offer it. You know what I mean? Now, side by side, when you compare the two fighters here in terms of IQ wise, very similar. You know, I think I give a small edge to Tomas because he's fought more in his division, right? IQ wise, you know, they're they're similar every which way, shape, or form. Though experience wise, again, Tomas has a small advantage there. He's been in this division, so IQ wise, experience wise, I give an edge to Tomas. Cardio wise, I do give an edge to Ibrahim. He's a smaller guy. He's shown he can be light on his feet. He can circle, and Tomas has shown he can get tired. Boxing wise. They're similar. Finishing-wise, they're similar. But again, I think Tomas has the more power. He's the bigger guy. I give Tomas an edge there on the finishing ability. Grappling-wise, it's pretty much even. But again, if Tomas lands on top of Ibrahim at some point in the, on the ground exchange, it's going to be impossible for Ibrahim to get up. It's going to be tough. So anyway, I hate to do it. I wanted to choose Ibrahim. I wanted to choose the Russian brother here at plus 230. I wanted to be like a dog or pass, take it. But the more you look at it, Tamaz should win the fight. Um, he should win the fight. And I emphasize should because at minus 333, it should be more like he will win the fight. But I don't have the kind of confidence that he will win. Matter of fact, I have more confidence that Marianne Zolkowski will win in the main event um, over Boris Mankowski than Tamaz uh, Narkon will win this fight. So with that said, I'm going to choose Tamaz Narkon to win the fight with a bit of caution. Good luck with this one, guys. All right, we're up to the main event here for KSW 66. It's a lightweight bout for a championship. At 155 pounds, we've got Boris Mankowski, the Tasmanian Devil, versus Marion Zelkowski, the Golden Boy. The Golden Boy is 23-8-1, 4-1 in his last five fights. He hails from Warsaw, Poland, 31 years old, 6 foot in height with 75-inch reach. He trains out of WC8 fight team. As for Boris Mankowski, who goes by the Tasmanian Devil, 22-8-1 overall, 3-2 in his last five fights. From Poznan, Poland, 32 years old. Five foot seven height with a 70 inch reach. He trains out of Siswani Smok. Now, according to Tapology, Zolkowski is getting almost 80% of the votes here coming in from the public. I do like Marion Zolkowski to win, but my goodness, give Boris Mankowski a little respect. As we break down the fight, you're going to hear uh, the Tasmanian Devil has quite uh, the resume, has fought some very good fighters now. Looking side by side on some comparisons, Marion Zolkowski has been a pro for 12 years and four months compared to Boris, who's been a pro for about 15 years. So both guys have 10 plus years as pro mixed martial artists, kickboxers, whatever you want to put it as, but they've been fighting grappling mixed martial arts of some kind for over a decade. Now, for fighting style, Marion Zolkowski is a kickboxer by trait. Nice standing up tall, wide stance, leg kicks, body kicks, um, upper body kicks, I mean upper head kicks, punching. He mixes it all up. A kickboxer by trade. Boris Mankowski, a wrestler through and through. If he does not get a takedown, his path to victory is limited. Now, for the weaknesses on both fighters, boxing is a weakness for Mankowski. Just like the grappling and wrestling are his strengths and his fighting style, his weakness is boxing. For Marion Zankowski, his, his strength is speed and striking, keeping in the outside, karate. His weakness is wrestling. He lost to Martuz Gamrot, which we'll talk about that fight, because he couldn't stop the takedowns and couldn't get up. All right, now, looking at the fighter's notes that I put together here. So, let's talk about Marion Zolkowski first. Marion Zolkowski has no amateur record. He went pro 2011. Obviously, both fighters hail from Poland. The Polish fighting scene is growing. Good fighters coming out of that part of the world. And Manzarek Marion Zolkowski has fought, what, 32, 33 total fights? Pretty good total record. His most notable opponent, he fought Matuz Gamrot 2020 and lost by decision. Now, Matuz Gamrot is currently in the UFC, so not a terrible loss there by decision. And just about two years ago, the things I like about Marion's game, high finish rate. He's finished 11 of his last 13 wins. He's been very accurate in the money line. So hear me out on this one. He was minus 265 favorite against Kazowsko. Now he won by decision. That was just his, what, that was, uh, how long ago was that fight here? Excuse me a second. Marion Zokowski, he fought uh, Kazowsko 2021. So in that fight, he was a minus 265 favorite. He won by submission. 
He was a plus 415 underdog against Gamrot. He lost that fight by decision. His prior fight, minus 230 favorite against Zemanski. He won via round four TKO. So in his last three fights, he's been a favorite, a dog, and a favorite. And every single time, it worked out exactly when the numbers had it. So with that said, he's been accurate in the money line. Currently right now, he's minus 200 in the money line. He was an underdog on the prior two fights before all that where he won both times. So again, money line-wise, Marion has been pretty accurate. He's won four of his last five fights, an active fighter, averaging about two fights a year. He's going to have several inches of height and reach here. As you can see, six inches compared to 5'7". I mean, six foot in height compared to 5'7". That's five inches in height, and we'll have a five-inch reach advantage as well. I think it's going to be notable because Marion Zolkowski is a striker, likes to work from distance, likes to use his kicking and his punching. Of course, Boris Mankowski will look to crowd him and bring it to the ground, but for Marion Zolkowski, he will have a significant advantage at the reach and punching in, the, in, that, in that department of the fight. Nice snapping lead jab. If you watch Marion Zolkowski on film, he does this thing where he almost leaps into his jab, it's not the best technique because you want your feet to be on the ground when you're landing your punches so it has the most power, but it's more of a snapping jab. He can really reach out and hit a guy who doesn't think he's in range. He'll reach out and touch that guy. And with Zelkowski, and Mankowski, I'm sorry, you'll recognize his guard is up in his film, but there's a wide open, it's like a field goal. He's got this wide open gap, like punch me right here in the nose. So I think at times Marin Zelkowski will be effective in leading that, that, that jump jab that he likes to land. So... Solid lower leg kicks from Marion Zokowski. I like the lower leg damage. He did some of his prior fights. He actually made a difference on some of the prior fights, forcing the fighters to change stances and actually get uncomfortable. He's usually the taller fighter. That's Zokowski. He usually works with his height and his range and his reach. He's going to have that advantage here. On the flip side, Boris Mankowski is usually the shorter fighter in his fight, so he's used to fighting guys who have length on him. My concerns with Marion Zokowski, my only issue I have with him, he did a very poor job against his wrestling defense with Gamrot. He lost that fight because of that. On the feet, the fight was equal. I don't know who was the fight on the feet. Very, very similar. But on the ground, Gamrot took him down, stayed heavy on top, and Marion could not get up. If that happens in this fight here, and Boris Mankowski takes him down multiple times, keeps him down, that'll be the path to victory for Boris, and that'll be the way Marion can lose the fight. Now, talking about Boris Mankowski, all right, no amateur record either. Again, plus 10, 10, 10 plus year pro experience. He's 11 and 5 in KSW. He's got M1 experience. He's on a four fight winning streak right now, if you include his recent boxing match that he had against Norman Park. He's a Southpaw. That's always interesting. Southpaw versus an Orthodox in Marion. He used to be. Um, He's used to being the shorter fighter, like I mentioned. He's used to being the guy who's a little bit smaller, a little bit shorter, shorter reach. He works in close, and in in he likes to work himself in close, get it up against the cage, get it to the mat. So he knows what to do when he's fighting a taller fighter. He's always fighting a taller fighter, right? Shouldn't be that much of an issue for him. I do think, though, Marion, if he plays his cards right, should be able to use that distance and be able to capitalize over the course of, you know, four or five rounds. Now, for Boran Mankowski, he's a solid wrestler. I want to emphasize solid. I saw him get reversed in wrestling. I've seen him have a hard time taking guys down. We'll talk more about that. But his wrestling at times is not as like world class as I think some people think it is. It's good. It's good. It's solid. Put it that way. It's solid. Okay. Now, notable opponents here for Boris Mankowski. And there's a long list. He fought Norman Park, lost by decision. Norman Park is 5'3 and 1 in the UFC. Now, he's not in the UFC anymore, but he was 5'3 and 1 in the UFC, a former UFC fighter. Um, he beat Norman Park in a boxing match in October of last year. So weird. Lost at mixed martial arts against Norman Park. Last fall, he fought him, beat him in a boxing match. David Zawada, current UFC fighter, one and four in the UFC. I understand that, but still current UFC fighter. He beat David Zawada round one via choke 2014. Um, Mataz Gamrot lost to him in a grappling bout in 2017. Again, Matuz Gamrot is a current UFC fighter, three and one in the UFC. Maribek Tazmuov, Maribek Tazmuov, TK lost to him in round 2010. That's also a current UFC fighter who's seven and two in the UFC. Marcin Held. Current PFL fighter, lost to him 2009 by decision. And then Jesse Taylor, a former Ultimate Fighter participant, he beat him round one via choke way back in the day, like 2012 or 13, something like that. So bottom line is Boris Mankowski has fought a very, very incredible list of opponents, all people that are hovering in or around the UFC level. Now, granted, he's lost most of those fights, but still has hell of experience. The positive like here on Mankowski, decent wrestler, pretty good wrestler, likes to take the fight to the ground, has a very strong hook, actually, when he's in close. Not a phenomenal boxer, but in close when it's in tight, he throws a nasty hook. He could hurt somebody with that. He was a minus 550 favorite over David Zawada in 2014. He won that fight round one via armbar. So he came in as a strong favorite against a guy who's in the UFC, got it done right away. Now, my concerns with Boris Mankowski, he drops his arms when he sets up a lot of strikes or when he goes to do, especially he kicks. When he goes to kick, which is not often, he just drops both arms, leaves himself wide open. He moves his head straight back when he's being attacked with punches. So instead of side to side movement or, you know, good foot movement to get out the way, it's just like a straight back thing. It's not a good strategy with Marion Zalkowski, who's going to reach him and still hit him. If he moves his head back, it's, not, it's still going to be right there in range, right? He has trouble getting the fight to the mat at times. So for example, against Park, he could not get Norman Park down. 
He tried early and often, couldn't make it happen. By round two, round three, he just gave up. Could get the fight to the ground, lost the fight. Now, he did do some damage to Park on the feet, did land a few heavy shots to Park. Park showed some damage. But overall, if Boris Mankowski does not get a takedown in two of the three rounds, he's losing then two of those three rounds. And that's a big issue with him. It's a liability. If he does not get the fight to the ground, he has a hard path to victory. Now, <clears throat> meanwhile, against Park, Park took him down with ease, especially late in the fight. I noticed Boris Mankowski got tired. He's got that build, like that strong, rocky man build. The problem is you get a little fatigued with that kind of build. And at the end of the fight against Park, Park was just taking him down with ease instead of him taking down Park. He looked fatigued in that fight. That's just my opinion. I'm not saying it's a major issue with all of his fights, but in the fight against Park, he looked tired at the end of the fight. Low finish rate for Mankowski. Four of his last six wins were via decision. His last three fights, including the boxing match, have all gone to decision. So had some finishes earlier in his career, recently slowing down. The boxing. He's got good volume boxing, but man, I don't know what it is. Limited power. He looks like he's powerful. He does. He's built like he's powerful, but there's limited power in his shots. He gets off balance at times. His footwork isn't amazing, and he leaves himself open. We mentioned the guard earlier. His guard is wide open. His hands are up, but they're like up like this, okay? And then he drops them, and he throws some kicks, and so he's open for punches in the middle. I think Mary Zolkowski could win this fight with his jab alone. Now, he comes up short also against elite-level fighters. We mentioned the long list of fighters he fought. All these different guys, UFC, in and out of the UFC, PFL, whatever. He lost against all those guys. So when he, fit, he fights better competition, he tends to come up a little bit short, right? He's got a limited kicking attack. I've watched minutes at a time go by here with Boris Mankowski where he does not throw any kicks. So that's a bit of a problem. He lost against Norman Park via decision as a minus 285 favorite. So keep that in mind. In that fight, he went in there as a minus 285 favorite and he lost against Park. The films that we watch of these two fighters to break down this film, we watched Boris Mankowski versus Taylor 2015, Mankowski versus Zawada 2014, Mankowski versus Park 2019, Zilkowski versus Kasako 2021, or Kaziko, I know I'm saying that wrong, I apologize, Zilkowski versus Gamrot 2020. So, both these guys have been on the mat with some guys that are pretty good. They both have been tested. Um, I think in this matchup, it's probably going to be close. I don't see Marion Zolkowski like getting Boris Mankowski out of there right away. It probably even goes to decision. These guys are very equally matched. They're both tough fighters. They have a lot of pride. They're both Polish. This thing is being held in Poland. They're going to have fans, family there. Um, but I think when you side-by-side -side measure them up, you know, Marion Zolkowski is going to have a slight edge in cardio, a slight edge in finishing ability, a slight edge in boxing. Grappling-wise, you would think that Mankowski has the edge. I'm just not sure. I feel like either he's getting away from his wrestling or he just gets maybe fatigued toward the end of the fight, and so the wrestling is not much of a factor. Experience-wise, they're, they're equal. IQ-wise, they're equal. I mean, 23-8-1, and 22-8-1, almost the same exact records here. I think Marion Zilkowski walks out of here with the title and still champion, and I think for Boris Mankowski, again, it's the same old situation with him where if he can't get the fight to the ground for extended periods of time, he loses the, loses the fight in the feet. And you're talking about over five rounds. Listen, the longer the fight is, the better here for the Marion Zolkowski people. If this is a 10-round fight, I'd take Marion Zolkowski all day, every day. The shorter the fight is, my concern that Boris Mankowski does win round one. It does get a takedown against Marion. Uh, does win even round two. I can see that happening. I can see Boris Mankowski winning round one. Round two kind of close. Gets takedowns. We creep into round three, four, five. No longer getting the takedowns. Forced to fight in his feet. The fight turns now heavily in the favor of Marion Zolkowski. Now, don't get me wrong. If Marion Zolkowski he wins round one or round two and just keeps rolling. That could be another method as well. But I just believe the takedown offense of Boris Mankowski, and he's a tremendous takedown artist. He's a good wrestler, world class. KSW is a world class promotion. He just runs into a problem at times when he starts to run out of gas. And I think Marion Zolkowski, who's working hard in his camp at WS WCA fight team, knows it's coming. He's going to defend the takedowns, work hard to keep that guy off the, off the ground, and basically force to fight the feet. So with that said, guys, I like Marion Zolkowski at minus two hundred. If it's available for me to bet, I like that price. It's a good price. I would even parlay it. Um, for Boris Mankowski fans who like the plus 160 money, I get that too. I just think you're talking about limited path to victory. Mary Zolkowski could win the fight on the feet, on the ground. He will probably keep the fight on the feet. That's his easiest path to victory. I like Mary Zolkowski. Good luck with this one, guys. All right, that brings us to the end of the breakdown here for KSW66 Zawalski versus Mankowski. Just a real quick refresh here of all the picks that we have to win. We like Marion in the main event. Tomas Narkin in the co-main event. We like Christian Ka Kazabowski to win over Tomas Romanowski. That's a dogger pass there. So Christian uh, Kazabowski is technically a dog at plus 105. We like Lucas Rajowski to beat Donovan Desmay. Sebastian Rajowski to win. Woj uh, Janaz to win his fight over Prez. We like Mikhail Materla to win his fight over Jason Radcliffe. In the prelims, we like Patrick Serdan and Casper to win their respective fights. So 
We are not going to be wagering anything on the first four fights in this card. So from Casper, Patrick, up to the first two fights in the main card, which is Macau and Woj, we're staying away from those fights. We're going to focus on the betting on the Sebastian Rajowski fight, Lucas Rajowski fight, the Tomas Romanowski fight, Tomas Narkin fight, and the main event, of course. Those fights, we feel like we have a better grasp on what's going on, those first few fighters. A lot of variables, a lot of unknowns. I think we should just watch it and stay away from betting on it. I probably will at least do one or two crazy lottery parlays just to have some fun with it if the opportunity is available on my book. But anyway, if you haven't done so already, check out the description for our videos. We have links in the description for prior fights of the fighters we're talking about. So you can do your own research, watch some of the fights. Maybe you pick up something that we didn't see. You know what I mean? That free library is always available for all of our breakdowns. Please use it. It's available. It takes a lot of time for us to put that together, and it's absolutely free. So please take advantage of it. One more thing. One more thing. If you haven't done so already, like and subscribe like and subscribe if you want more content from us and it's always free like and subscribe you'll get the chance to see what's going on what's new with us so thanks for joining us guys happy happy new year we're about to get slammed with a bunch of mixed martial arts here so the, the wait was worth it guys you got one championships invicta you've got uh ksw you've got obviously ufc fighting on the on the brink it's all coming guys little patience it's just around the corner thanks for joining us guys peace